Do you think there are any scenarios where fractional work doesn't work? So what we found is that the red line, though, on any particular team, uh, long term is around 50 percent. So you can have a substantial percentage of a team be fractional, but it's hard to have the whole team be fractional. Well, in the ideal world, you'd like someone full time to be available for that. So we're starting to explore where, you know what, that's that's another limitation of a fractional model. The person is yeah. not around all the time. And we're back for another episode of the Startup Hustle. This is your host, Matt Watson. Very excited today to be joined by Praveen Gunta, who is the founder and CEO of Higher Fraction. We're going to also talk about his background from Hidden Levers today and how that got him to start uh, this new company he has. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about hiring fractional talent. Like, There's a lot of options for that. Um, really excited about that, and, and I think there's a ton of benefit to it. Um, as most of you know, my company is full scale. We do software development for other people. We do a little bit of fractional work, but not a lot of it from our team in the Philippines. We have over 300 employees. Praveen, you've got employees. Are they all in the U.S.? Tell us more about your company. Yeah, so Fraction, you know, and we all, we can talk about it more. It was really formed, though, from our experience, you know, with Hidden Levers, my previous startup. Uh, but uh, we really keyed in on that idea of working fractionally. So think half time, sometimes quarter time, but usually it ends up being half time with U.S. based senior talent. So we we sort of keyed in on this fractional idea as being a good way to be able to tap into people that we probably couldn't afford to hire otherwise. And uh, so that's how it started. It worked well for us at my last startup. And so then after selling, thought about what to do next and uh, kept coming back to this idea of, you know, this fractional concept, I think it really works saved us a ton of money and was effective in terms of productivity. So should we try to roll that out to clients, to other companies? So tell us a little more about Hidden Levers and what Hidden Levers did. Yeah. So one thing to say, it's funny, Matt, um, we used to always joke that um, our backup plan, if Hidden Levers or Hidden Levers didn't work, was that we would just start Hidden Lovers because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> so, uh, oh, my God. Yeah, but um, but yeah, Hidden Levers, what we did was uh, portfolio stress testing for financial advisors. So still germane today, you know, if you, if you happen to work with a financial advisor, if anybody does, you know, clients will oftentimes have questions like, well, what will happen to my, you know, my investments if, if might be, I don't know, if interest rates stay really high, if inflation gets really bad again and prices don't come down. If, uh, oh, maybe the opposite happens and like home prices are so high. What if they come down? Maybe I can buy a house, but will that be bad for the economy? Will that be bad for my other stuff, like my stocks? So all sorts of questions that um, that uh, folks would have for their financial advisors, we were putting tools in advisors' hands to be able to try to answer those questions. Okay. So we did that. Started in, uh, in 2010, so kind of like coming out of the financial crisis and um, built that business for about a decade, I guess a little more, sold in 2021. Uh, bootstrap journey the whole way, uh, which of course you're super familiar with. Um, but uh, yeah, I think between myself and my co-founder, Raj, we put in about 10 grand all told. And so oh, wow. really, yeah, so really it was just sweat equity was really what it was. You know, I was building the product and he was trying to sell the product. And uh, the good news was that we found an audience and financial advisors that if we could build something they actually wanted to buy, they did have money to spend and they were willing to spend it. And uh, so we were able to grow organically with that and got ourselves up to a run rate of about 8 million. And, uh, you know, one of the tools that we used to be profitable was the fractional hiring. Uh, but one of the things we we're very proud of, like as we got to exit was uh, we had about a 50% profit margin. So 50% even wow. margin. Um, yeah, that was something that we, we really dialed in on. I mean, it was some combo of, like I said, the fractional stuff, but also we just insourced like anything. We never had a lawyer um, in part because my co-founder, you know, he actually was a, a barred attorney at one time. Uh, so that was his background. I did the taxes myself. I'm not a CPA, but I did the taxes myself for like the first five, six years. Uh, so have some finance background, but you know, so we would just do stuff like that. Uh, anyway, that helped drive our profitability. And so when we went to exit, so we sold in 2021, you know, high times in the market, but the thing that I'm proud of from that, you know, from that exit is that um, 
the company that bought us, they actually had to go to the debt markets. They raised the capital, the cash to make that acquisition, but we were profitable enough that we were paying our own way. So our profits could cover the interest of right. that debt. And so, so it's not that common when you buy a startup company as like the acquirer to actually have that raise your profitability. And we were proud that that was something we were doing for our acquirer. Yeah, I can relate to that because I just bought out uh, my business partner at Fullscale. I owned half of it before I, I bought him out and it's a similar story. It's like I could get, you know, bank financing to basically finance, you know, paying him out and cash mm -hmm. flow it from the profits of the company, like similar sort of thing. So, um, and the, and for those who ever thought about that, that kind of stuff, there's great SBA programs, all these things actually for buying businesses that you can buy profitable businesses and the government, um, has a very good program. So that's a great option. But uh, so the huge uh, congrats to you. That's that's an amazing business. Fifty percent margins like that. Th those are SaaS margins. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. No. And it was. Um, and that was a SaaS business that we were able to. Um, and I remember talking to like VCs in the early days. You know, folks that I knew in that in that space. And they were like, "Well, listen, man. If you really got you know true SaaS margins and your your gross margin is up there, you know, well over ninety percent, and you're able to reinvest that." you don't need us. And this was, you know, folks yeah. were in the VC industry, so they're willing to say that. But, uh, you know, we, it's not like, so I've never actually raised the dime in my life. I, I've just never kind of gone down that road. I like to say, I'm not like, I'm not philosophically opposed to it. It's just that if I were going to raise capital for a business, I would want to have a clear idea of how I was going to spend it. And the trouble was always that, you know, as we were growing that business or even today, as we grow, uh, as we grow fraction, I feel like you've got to spend the money, you know, you've got to work hard at the very beginning just to get off the ground. And I don't think money helps that much with that, with getting those first few customers and, and really sort of that first step. But then from there, you start to get some cash flow running. And I feel like you've got to invest that first with discipline and know what you're doing there. And I guess it's just been the case that, we found that to be adequate because if you gave me another million dollars, I'm like, I don't exactly know how to spend this. I feel like I might mismanage it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that for sure. Like, especially when people raise like a hundred million dollars, I'm right. like, I don't know what they do with this except waste a lot of it. So tell me more about Fraction. You, you mentioned before at Hidden Levers, you had some developers you hired Fractionally that kind of worked for you part time. What, so at Hidden Levers, how did you, you know, from that time, how did you work with those developers to make that successful? Like, did those people, they had, a, did they have a full-time job? And so they were kind of working evenings. Like, how, mm -hmm. how did you integrate these kind of more part-time people into the team? Yeah, that's a great question. And so the, the kind of the backstory on why we even tried this was really because we were bootstrapping, right? So we didn't have a lot of resources and it was probably maybe late 2011, early 2012, somewhere in there is where it was like mid 2011, we finally start to acquire some real customers, paying customers and have a bit of product market fit. So we'd actually had a lot of hijinks before that, where we tried to sell this, you know, the same product, but we tried to sell it retail to retail investors. We tried to do all kinds of things and we weren't, you know, making a lot of progress. And we finally stumbled upon really this financial advisor market and started to get some traction. Well, one of the first questions they asked us was, well, does it work with software XYZ that I already use? So in that right. wealth management industry. And I was the only tech person. So I was building, you know, I was writing the code, building the platform. And, you know, my co-founder was selling. By that time, we'd actually hired someone else on the business side. Uh, but uh, I didn't have time to go and write a bunch of integrations in addition to the feature work that I was doing. And so it was like, okay, how are we going to get this done? And I happened to uh, a friend of mine, uh, worked at AT&T locally here in Atlanta that I had worked with in the past. And I knew that he was bored out of his mind, <laughs> big sort of, you know, fortune 500 job, you know, he's not really uh, so busy. And so I knew he had some spare capacity. So I just asked him, well, you know, Hey, would you want to do some moonlighting and uh, help knock out these integrations? And the way we worked it out, we, we thought, well, you know, if you put in about half time, about 20 hours a week, then that would probably be effective you've already got a full-time thing. And so if we can do this steadily on the side, would you be open to sort of a discounted rate? Because obviously there's lots of developers, lots of folks in general who will do gigs, do moonlighting. What we were finding was that oftentimes they wanted to charge a premium rate because 
of the annoyance of having to go and get new gigs all the time. So you're always right. interviewing or trying to prove yourself every time for like a month of work or, you know, six weeks of work. And so instead, my thought process with my friend, so hell, I, I told him, I said, hey, if this works, we'll just keep on doing it. And nine years later, it was before he actually wrapped up. So it was a long run, it turned out with, with him. And yeah. that was one of the things that we found was that if we were to engage with the developer in this fractional way, that uh, the turnover would actually be really low. They would be, they would just be willing to keep on doing it. Uh, and then to answer your concrete question, well, what about like working style and how were you in touch? Um, in those days, this is like pre Slack actually, um, we were using Skype for the longest time. So it was okay. just like Skype messaging, but you know, in a similar way. So we were just doing that plus a couple calls a week and we would, um, you know, manage the work so that, you know, partly because of that integration work was something a little bit separable with like, we sort of set up the architecture for how it was going to be done and then let him take it one unit at a time. Um, I will say that something really important was that, that I came to realize was, it was almost a necessary condition. Was it that, you know, the first developer we hired and then all the subsequent ones, um, they were very senior. So in his case, 20 years of experience, Call it, oh, yeah. you know, so really folks that know how to manage themselves independently, you know, and work on a problem and also do things like, um, oh, well, this isn't working. Well, let me go back in the test environment and play around. Let me try to do some actual active debugging. Let me try a different case, you know, actually go through all of those steps without having any handholding. And um, I think that was, you know, part of the recipe for success, too. So most of the people that are working through your firm now, which is hirefraction.com, you guys check it out, um, do most of them have a full-time job or do they work multiple sort of freelance gigs like this? Or I think maybe you mentioned mm -hmm. before, some of them have maybe their own startup and they're, they're doing yeah. this sort of to fund their startup. Like what do you, what do you normally see? Yeah, we've seen an interesting mix. Uh, we, we, I feel like the idea uh, I mean, hopefully we were at the right time sort of with coming into this model. I feel like we're hearing fractional notions of fractional work and this sort of, there's a little bit of a buzz around it now, but it, it, it seems like one of the things we're hearing even from developers is that they want to diversify their income. Maybe, you know, some folks have been through a round of layoffs or something like that. And so they don't want to just work for one employer. So we are seeing some folks who are um, this sort of consulting arrangement where they take on a couple of clients is certainly, you know, a part of our pool. Uh, a good chunk of folks do have a full-time role, like just, you know, like we'd seen in the past. And then, you know, to the point that you just made about, um, we talked before about founders. We've seen a surprising number of folks like that who um, bootstrapping is sort of maybe back in vogue. Maybe the VC uh, purse is a little tighter than it was. And, and folks are realizing that maybe bootstrapping is a legitimate option for starting a company, but maybe they still need a little bit of a runway. And so they are bootstrapping along with working fractionally. And uh, the last group that I shouldn't forget is that there's some folks that just want to work part time, whether they're sort of near like tons of experience and maybe nearing a point in their career where they want to downsize their career a little bit. And then, of course, you got folks with family kind of responsibilities or other responsibilities. They just they only want 20 hours. So we yeah. see that, too. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely see that with uh, maybe, you know, people that want to be a stay at home mom or dad or whatever and balance yeah. all sorts of, of busy schedules, but maybe work part time through the day. Like, um, you know, there's all these different kind of gig economy things out there that, that people do. Mm -hmm. And, um, doing this for software is yet another option, right? Like some people are on Upwork or all these other things too, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I love the model of this. I think it's great. And, so tell us uh, the different types of roles that you help provide your clients. Like what types of talent do you provide? Sure. And, you know, it was interesting. Some of this was like experimentation because we had done it ourselves for so long, having worked with folks this way for, for a decade. Uh, because like, so just going back to that, you know, that history a little bit, our CTO, when we originally hired um, the guy who would go on to be our CTO at Hidden Levers, um, so I was wearing that hat initially as the original developer, right? But eventually as the company grew, I was like, you know, I could use some help there too. But he actually started as a fractional sort of senior developer and, and then eventually transitioned into more hours and then full time and then on to that role. So we found it was sort of like a way to bring folks in. Um, but so even that sort of like tech leadership roles we've seen work, um, 
I feel like you see a lot of that these days. Like there are a lot of, let's say, fractional CTOs, CFOs, CMOs, folks like that that you see out there yeah. uh, marketing their services. But we actually started from that individual contributor level more so. So it was actually, no, we're just hiring folks to get work done fractionally. We even, um, we did this in marketing. So some of it was like completely different roles. What I'll say with, you know, with Fraction as a company today, what we focused on is principally software and product adjacent roles. And so we found that it works well, both for software engineering, but also for product management, project management, UI, UX. So a lot of the kind of components of, you know, what you'd need to build a full software team. And so what, can you give us an idea of what those rates look like? Yeah. So one of the things that we've done as well, maybe this is just coming from like a SaaS background, uh, that I prefer transparency, and, you know, so they're all just public on our site. So if you were to go, just like if you were to go to any SaaS website, and you were to go to the plans page, we literally have a page like that on higherfraction.com. And uh, so halftime, what we found is that we can create an, an, a pool of excellent engineers here in the U.S. Uh, for 8000 a month, which works out to about $80 an hour. And uh, that, as we see kind of like in the full-time hiring space as well, senior product managers, folks who are really bringing a lot of product, you know, value from the product side, it is similar. So 8K a month. On the project management side and UI UX, uh, more around 7,000. And this is all for like half time. So that works. These numbers all work out to around, you know, 70 or, or 80 an hour. Uh, we do also offer quarter time. What's interesting there. So quarter time. So, you know, call it around, you know, 10 hours uh, a week. We do we do hear from startups and from from companies that are interested. Oh, you know, we just think that's that's the you know, how we want to engage. Maybe that's a budget concern. I'm going to be transparent and frank and say that. We have found, we tried it and we failed, you know, in transparency. Uh, when we've tried to engage a, a developer, you know, maybe to join a team or even be part of a project. And this is in any real tech stack. When I say real tech stack, I mean like actual code, not low code. Um, but in any, in virtually any tech stack, the ramp up required to really get going with a team means that at least that first month needs to be half time. They need to have some, you know, some meat to the engagement. Yeah. A month, maybe two. And then after that, they can actually accomplish things on an ongoing basis, maybe quarter time. But we, you know, we've tried and we've struggled with starting quarter time. So that's one thing that we've learned. On on the other hand, low code, because we are seeing interest in that. So low code solutions, you can start quarter time because a lot of the framework is already there for you. And, and so you can you can make an impact that way. And then other roles like UI, UX and uh, project product management, you can also make an impact at quarter time. I do want to take a second to remind everybody this episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale, which is my company. Uh, we have 300 software developers that work for dozens of other startups and scale-ups doing all sorts of different types of software development. You can check us out at fullscale.io. We do a little bit of fractional work as well, um, but all of our employees are in the Philippines, so it's, it's a little different. Um, do you think there are any scenarios where um, fractional work doesn't work? Like, are there scenarios where it's not a good choice or not a good option? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting evolution that we're seeing um, with some of the teams that we're running. But I'll, I'll step back and say from our own experience, like when I was, you know, in those shoes of running a SaaS startup and considering, well, how far can we take this fractional idea? So to give you a sense, when we sold the company, I think we had on an FTE basis, like the full-time equivalent basis, we had like 24, maybe 25 employees. Uh, but actually, a lot of those were fractional halftime folks consolidated. So it was probably more like low 30s, but maybe as many as a dozen folks were actually halftime. So what we found is that the red line, though, on any particular team, uh, long-term is around 50%. So you can have a substantial percentage of a team be fractional, but it's hard to have the whole team be fractional. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the company Gumroad. Um, I don't think so. Who's got? They've gotten pretty big. They they they're sort of like a almost like a Shopify for digital like digital goods that creators make, and so creators can okay. like set up their Gumroad page to sell all sorts of like digital products and subscriptions okay. and things like that. Um, 
So that's they're the rare company that's gotten you know pretty substantial. I think it's several hundred people uh, on their team, and they're one hundred percent fractional in the sense that nobody's allowed to be full time. <laughs> it's sort of a wow. So totally different, yeah, very different model. The max, I think, the cap on the number of hours that you're allowed to sign up for to work is thirty or thirty two or something like that. I wonder why they do that. Is that to avoid paying like benefits or like I wonder what what yeah. the what the no, deal actually, is there? I, I think it was some. Yeah, I'd have to look look up more into the story, but it was some sort of cultural shift that they decided on. They used to be sort of a VC funded, a VC funded, or they were. I mean, they they had VC backing. Uh, go for broke kind of mentality. And then they had this shift where they're like, no, you know what? We're going to dial back. This isn't working for us. And um, from what I understand, they've become profitable since then. And they're actually doing pretty well, but they also wanted a pioneer. So, you know, you've seen some companies that'll do like the four day work week and they just sort of took it maybe a step further differently. And were like, you know what? We're going to make this business work for people's lives. And so anyway, that's interesting. I say that only to say that clearly a company has managed to make it work that way. What we're finding is we do have several teams that we've built, software teams uh, for clients that since fractional is what we do, they are entirely fractional and they've successfully stood up and built products, you know, that have gotten into production. And that's where for us, the question is now is when it comes to production support, when it comes to some of these kinds of activities, well, in the ideal world, you'd like someone full time to be available for that. So we're starting to explore where, you know what, that's that's another limitation of a fractional model. The person is yeah. not around all the time. And what we ask for, you know, just so everybody gets a sense for it, like, oh, does fractional mean they just work nights and weekends? What we ask for is um, at least an hour a day of synchronous availability. So meaning like during U.S. business hours, you know, you can be on up to an hour a day, like actually like on a call if needed. And you can be on Slack or Teams or whatever the client wants to use you know, intermittently throughout the day. And then the rest of the time is async, which is pretty similar to most developers, right? It's not like most yeah. developers sit there, you know, on meetings all day. So we try to keep it in that sense similar. So the one of the great things about this is you could find somebody that has very specific skill sets, right? So when somebody comes to you and they say, I need a developer who does view with, you know, Node.js backend or whatever, all these things. Do you guys really, are you able to like really find the right candidate in this? Like how hard is it to go and, and find these people? Yeah. So that's one of the things um, that we like about the model. I guess the the pitch line would be that, you know, the best developers, honestly, the best talent already has a job. So why not hire them fractionally? But that cuts two ways. Yes, that's kind of true that, yeah, the, the best people do have a job. Um it also means that you can find virtually any type of talent though, right? Because your pool is not limited by just the people who are currently looking. It's yeah. almost anybody. And in my experience now, having talked to probably closing in on a thousand developers in this vein, uh, roughly 50% are interested in the idea. Like they would like to do it. And then not everybody is able to between, of course, there's the interview process, but beyond that, like just even time availability, like some folks they're, they're, um, uh, What's the expression? Their eyes are bigger than their stomach in terms of like yeah. how much work they want to take on, right? And and so some folks will we'll actually look at that. We'll look at, well, let's walk through your week. What are the time constraints you have? And we'll find out that they don't. Um, but uh, but yeah, so being able to find, I'll give you, I'll give you a concrete example. It was a company that was looking for um, not a typical tech stack, but rather uh, what they call PLC, so Programmable Logic Controller. Uh, okay. So this is like, kind of close to the hardware type of work, but they needed somebody who could program robots in a factory. And most of their folks were on site as you need to be in that kind of context. And this was like uh, robotic uh, arms that were helping build like wind turbine masts. I guess those really tall, you know, kind of the mass that the wind turbines are on. And um, anyway, so they needed someone to help with that more so to uh, help refactor code that was kind of already in the system. So they didn't need to be at the factory. They could do it remotely. Um, so yeah, we were able to find that for a specific type of programmable logic control unit. But that's like a hyper specific yeah. sort of way out there example. Whereas the view or, you know, react or even Svelte slash node or Django, those folks are common enough that, you know, we can, we expect that we should be able to very quickly like source, you know, those kinds of developers and, and, and build a team. Are there, 
How, how do you find these people? Well, nowadays it's, you know, it, it's been interesting. We like, like I'm sure that, that full scale does there in the Philippines uh, probably. And like, you know, like everybody does, you know, you'll post job listings and things like that. So initially we felt like we had to not felt like we did do that. We were getting, uh, you know, responses very quickly in large volumes so we had to filter through. These days we're actually working mostly off inbound. So developers and architects and all sorts of folks across the tech spectrum will just see us on LinkedIn or hear about it. And uh, we're honestly working mostly through the pool of inbound applicants at this point. Okay. Do you, how do you market your business? So how do people know about Fraction? Well, uh, you know, we, we love getting on podcasts, Matt. <laughs> of course. Uh, that's, everyone one great, that's one great marketing channel. Yeah, I know we I certainly have gotten more active on LinkedIn in particular. Um, we definitely, you know, are doing the uh, the Google ads and all the traditional things. But I will say this, what we're finding, and I'm sure maybe, you know, some listeners can empathize with this or maybe have found this too, um, in-person interaction. I feel like all of the online channels have gotten really um, kind of crowded, whether it's outbound email or um, you name it, people you know, have a visceral negative reaction to being contacted on, let's say a LinkedIn or a platform like that. Even worse, if you try to text somebody, I can't blame them. Like, how would we feel? Right. So, um, that, that is getting more challenging. Uh, but you meet somebody in person, even if you only have a 60 second, 30 second conversation with them, you're a real human all of a sudden. And so then even if you continue that conversation digitally, or maybe they get something from you via email later, uh, there's a level of trust there and having met that human before in this world of like, you know, deep fakes and everything that's obviously only going to continue ex- advancing, you know, with generative AI, I feel like the in-person. So we're, we're leaning into that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like we're going to a lot more local events. We're filling up our conference schedule. So we're doing a lot of that uh, in addition to the digital. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, full scale is a very similar business in, in some ways. And I know for us, cold calling and emailing people and and cold outreach on LinkedIn and stuff like that. Yeah, people don't like any of that stuff. They don't respond to any of that. They it's like one in a thousand will respond mm-hmm. or something. Like the numbers are really low. But what works more than, you know, but what really works is you're selling trust, right? You're it's relationships mm-hmm. and referrals and it, it's a trusted transaction at least for us on the full scale side. Most of our customers come from either referral or somebody that's followed me on LinkedIn for a while or listen to the podcast for a while. And they have some more, you know, form of trust because of that. Right. Right. So, you know, I think there's a lot of services um, like ours that are sold based on trust. Like people just Mm -hmm. don't respond to a random email and then spend a hundred thousand dollars a year on something like that doesn't usually happen. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a funny thing. We were And I was talking to our team and this was at some point last year, we, you know, we have a developer portal and we've tried to to take sort of a a software view coming again from that SaaS product background of like, well, how can we, you know, have a developer portal where uh, prospects or, you know, folks can come in and they can filter through for the talent that they want. And maybe they could just reserve somebody right then and there and, uh, you know, get going. Like, could we make this as seamless a transaction as possible? And to your point, like what we come to find out is that, no, this is a trust-based uh, process. So there's a certain element of the searchability and all of that that's helpful. But at the end of the day, uh, you do business with folks that you trust, particularly in service. And then the way I differentiate, I'm not sure if you felt this with you know, any of your past like SaaS you know, uh, startups, but when you're selling that product, you can kind of lead with the product to an extent. Like they don't, right. have, to, they don't have to trust Praveen or Matt, they can trust, okay, does this product work or not? Right. But here we don't necessarily have that. And so it is a social proof and a human trust kind of a business. So you said you have a, a portal that people can log into. Um, so does anybody go in there and, and like pick a developer or do they just come to your, to, you know, to your staff and you're like, just find somebody who do you recommend? Like which way does it like 90% of it? They just ask for your recommendation or how does that go? I would say that, you know, since we've had that stood up and, and, and live, a lot of folks do start there and, you know, and, you know, we'll, we'll look around at folks and it may be, and occasionally we will see concrete expressions of interest in like in-person X. Um, but, uh, 
it'll end up being a combo. So we'll see that folks are, have that interest and then we'll engage with them, you know, and really work out, okay, what are all the finer point details of um, what you're looking for? I mean, I feel like it's probably similar to like, cause we thought about we're like, oh, well, do we wanna, you know, do some of our own work here and put some generative AI in and have it be like chatbot style. And you sort of get close to the mark, but you don't get to the mark a lot of the time, at least with the current state of the art with that. And so we're like, okay, rather than put folks through that, let's just engage with them on a, on a human level and really, because you have to peel the onion quite often. They don't necessarily know exactly, exactly what they need until you have a little bit of that conversation too. Yeah. Yeah. I ask because we have something similar at full scale. You can log in and see all of our employees that are available and um, it, it's either overwhelming or people don't know really what they want or they don't know who to pick or it's just hard to tell from looking at some form mm -hmm. of profile, right? Um, but yeah, I would say like 80 to 90% of the time on our side, people just come to us and are like, who do you recommend? Who's the best developer you have that does mm -hmm. React or whatever it is? They just want recommendations. Like they just, they yeah. value our trust, right? And making the, those referrals and I think, frankly, they just don't want to work that hard of like digging through all of it either. But that's why I'm yeah. kind of, that's why I was curious if you've had a different experience. But no, I mean, it makes sense too because it's sort of like if you're asking the person to do that shopping, well, it almost gets back to the other extreme, which is like, well, if I want to do all this work, I could post the job myself and filter through people and figure it, try to figure yeah. it out. Or if I want to go with a trusted provider, then let me let me do that. Let them do that. Well, that reminds me, when we talked about this before, did you say that if I hire somebody from you, I don't even, I don't interview them? You you select them and then assign them to my account, basically, and I get like a trial period? Is that what you told me before? Yeah, you know, so the, the approach that we decided to take there, and I'm, I'm curious how it, you know, compares or jives with your experience at full scale, but uh we originally sort of tried out the traditional sort of interview model. And what we found was that there was a disjoint because remember we're fractional, you know, in kind of our approach. And so there was a disjoint between companies, typical interview process when they think like, oh, I'm hiring a full-time person. That's the only way I've ever hired. So let me do the four rounds of interviews and let me have my whole yeah. process versus our thought process. Well, no, this is fractional anyway. We think it's going to be more efficient for both sides. And honestly, don't waste your own time let's just get going. And if the person is working out, then keep rolling. And if not, so from that, we decided on, Hey, let's do a trial. And so in that seven day trial, we tell clients, Hey, if you, you know, what we'll do is we'll, we'll show a couple of profiles that the folks, you know, a couple that we think are the best fit and decide on one together with them. And, uh, then that person will start. And we tell those who are kind of skittish about this idea, Hey, if you want the first seven days to be an extensive interview, that's up to you. But we think that the best way to see it is get them in your repo, get their build environment going, assign them some real work and see if they can do the job or not. So when I, if I log in and I, I look at those profiles, what do I see? Do I just see like a, a resume CV or do I see like a video of them or like tests that they've done or like how, what all do you show them? Yeah, so it's um, it is a combo, I guess, of a CV plus sort of like key technologies highlighted, key industry areas highlighted. We've considered, you know, and I think that we're still um, we're still mulling through that whether it's worth us, uh, you know, doing videos, you know, with every person that sort of thing. So we haven't we haven't gone to that step yet. But uh, I don't know, is that something that you've considered doing or that you've tried? Yeah, we, we used to do videos before COVID. Uh, all of our employees worked in an office, so it was easy to do the video. And then since COVID, we all went remote, and so we haven't been doing any more. But um, one of our initiatives for this year is to start doing video again. Okay. Um, we One of the things we did that was super cool is we would record like a 10 or 20 second video of just the employee like doing something weird and funky, like just showing their personality. I could be a little oh, yeah. dance or whatever, like just something, something. And I don't know what it was, but something about that little video that showed their personality just made it seem more like a person and a human being, right? Instead of, you yeah. know, these profiles that sort of just look like somebody has a mugshot. And, you know, vid video just tells a different story as part of the For point, sure. right? So I loved it when we did those videos and that's an initiative we're trying to do again, but 
we're also considering trying to do more of like an interview style video. Like, do you, mm -hmm. you know, ask him questions for 10 or 20 minutes or something and get yeah. a better sense for him? And for, for us, you know, something we're always focused on too is how do we, how do we showcase what it's like to work with somebody from the Philippines? You know, mm -hmm. their communication skills, their English, just their culture, sure. like, what, what would that be like? Because a lot of people just don't know. So sure. for us, I think video is is super important. And but I mean, I think even for what you do, it's important because like you don't you know you don't know these people, and yeah, I think it's gives you a better idea of their personality and stuff like that. It's like, eh, can I work with this person? So I like video. Yeah, no, no, I I and one hundred percent agree with what you're saying. We the funny thing is is that when we briefly thought about it, the only video that we had potentially to use was the video of our screening interviews with them, which yeah. those feel kind of high stakes and, you know, at times messy. I mean, some of them, you know, you could just post them and, they would, and it comes off great. Uh, but then we thought, well, is that really the video? Like, are those sort of like unfiltered videos, the ones that we want to just throw up there? I mean, there's value in those for sure. Uh, or do we want to give the you know, developer a chance to, to tell their story in some way? I mean, maybe that is by answering sort of yeah. questions or interview style or, like you mentioned, which sounds pretty cool, actually, the idea of the quirks. Even though all of our folks are based here in the U.S., you're absolutely right. Like you don't know a person and um, getting a chance to see that a little bit, I think, does add value. So yeah. it's just a, it, it may well be an investment worth making for us as well. Well, I'm super excited to see how your business continues to evolve. And I think there, for a lot of people out there, I think it makes a lot of sense to use a, a combination of what full scale does and what your company does, you know, especially hiring a, a fractional CTO or a fractional lead developer or product person mm -hmm. or whatever, and being able to marry that with our offshore team from the Philippines, you know, mm -hmm. obviously our rates are um, much lower than, than yours. You know, our rates are generally 20 to $40 an hour, right? Right. Um, for, for a full-time person. So the, the rates are very good. And um, the, you know, one of the one of the people I talked to the other day um, was interesting. He 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 didn't really necessarily want to interview our people. You're, we were talking about interviewing. You know, mm -hmm. how you're not doing interviews, and he brought up a really good point. He's like, you know, if I have to interview these people, then you know, you guys didn't do your job. Like, it was your job right. to interview and hire really good talent. If you didn't hire and really, and you know, if you didn't hire really good talent, then it's like, why am I working with you? Like that was the advantage of working with you, right? And so, right, I think that's something else that you know both of our companies have to keep in mind, right? Like people come to us because we provide quality talent. It's all about talent at the end of the day. So, yeah, no, I think that's that is absolutely right. Like that's like one of the core core value props. I I totally agree, though. I think that one of the things that we're seeing. So interestingly. Uh, this idea of a CTO or a senior architect, someone who can be in a leadership role, marrying that with, you know, a quality offshore team is something that we're seeing, you know, potentially interest in, or we're even seeing, and in fact, I'm uh, talk, you know, in the early days, just started working with a new client where uh, I think that that's the missing ingredient they need to accelerate their offshore team's success. It's not necessarily that offshore developers aren't uh, qualified. There's lots of folks that are technically qualified these days in many locations around the world. But in terms of getting high productivity from them, you sometimes you need that bridge, you know, uh, closer to your closer to home, closer to your own company yeah. to do that. And the the interesting aspect of that is that we have seen a lot of positive lift with clients from even just say ten hours a week or quarter time with the CTO level candidate. Yeah, hundred percent. We've also we've also seen this is the interesting part uh, for me, Matt, is that we've seen um, CTO level candidates that I thought would be really kind of unaffordable, and we're able to we've been able to offer folks who've had exits, who have started YC back companies, uh, who have raised in one case uh, twenty plus million, you know, for a past startup. So they've done some of those things. They've been there. Uh, even in so much as they could be helpful to a business founder on the other, you know, at a client in terms of just like, what was your experience with these things? Um, that those kinds of folks were able to bring them to the table quarter time at that same $8,000 a month. So, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people out there that do fractional CTO sort of work. I've talked to a bunch of them on LinkedIn and, um, depending on how many hours they work and who they are, you know, I've heard rates from five to $10,000 a month, kind of in these kind of, you know, range. Right. And 
that is much more affordable to a small company that they couldn't afford $300,000 a year for a CTO and stock mm-hmm. options and all these things that they probably want. So five to 10 grand somewhere in that ballpark is something, you know, much more palatable. So it, it's a great offering and, and something that a lot of people use. And a lot of people don't need a full-time CTO, just like they don't need a full-time lawyer. They probably mm-hmm. don't need a full-time CMO. They don't need a full-time CFO. Like a lot of these things they don't need full-time. Um, if they've got other great, you know, engineers that are doing the work on a daily basis, they may need to an hour or two a day just to make sure everybody's getting work done. They've got the right process of procedures. So I'm a huge fan. I love this. Yeah, no, we think that that's a huge growth area. And, and it's really been surprising to me to see that, that these really top end talent folks that they are available, you know, as you're saying at a reasonable, you know, relatively reasonable level when it's bite-sized. You know, if you want to yeah. get that person full time, all in on your team, you're either making them a co-founder or yeah. you're paying them the big bucks. And this is another way to access that. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Again, this was Praveen Gunta with HigherFraction.com. Um, absolutely love your guys' model. Um, once again, today's episode is brought to you by FullScale. You can check us up at check us out at FullScale.io. Um, as we exit the show today, do you have any other final words for other entrepreneurs out there? Final words for other entrepreneurs. So this is one, you know, since we're talking about software development, particularly this is this is sort of for early stage entrepreneurs. Consider low code for that first prototype. You know, just get something out there, get something out the door. And I think that uh, there's a lot of quality tools out there. We actually built the first version of our developer portal in a tool called Softer which ended okay. up being super easy to do and, and very inexpensive. And once we saw value in that, people were signing up for the portal and, and actually taking a look. We're like, okay, now we'll invest in, and rebuild it to have more capabilities and to look nicer. But hey, get the prototype out there because you don't know what customers will actually respond to. That's great advice. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.